Making a Living Trust, the complete guide for rookies. Living trusts aren't as complicated as they sound. In this video, we share with you a few steps you need to make a legally sound living trust. The majority of people create a living trust to avoid probate, but you also can use one to transfer control of your property to someone if you become incapacitated to name beneficiaries and to establish property management for young beneficiaries. Keep in mind, you can have an attorney make a simple probate avoidance trust for you, or you can create one yourself. Watch this video to find out more. Welcome back, folks, to another edition of Sweetie Kiwi. How are you doing today? I hope you are doing fantastic. I'm doing marvelous, if you were to ask me. If you are doing as great as I am, go grab a cup of coffee or tea or vodka and let's roll. Today, I want to talk to you about how to make a living trust, and I'm going to give you a complete guide, especially for rookies, in very simple language. We'll, 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 we'll try to avoid the legalese as much as possible. The first thing you want to do is to decide what you need. Do you need a shared trust or an individual trust? So let's say you're married or you are in a domestic partnership and you and your spouse or partner own most of your property together, a shared trust may be the right way to go because it allows you to have to lay out all the, the options, the possibilities, all the legal implications for a transfer of property in the short and long term. Your other choice is two individual trust. So if you are with a partner and for some reason you want at this moment in time want to have separate legal responsibilities, you can create two individual trusts. After you decide whether you need a shared trust or an individual trust, you want to move on to figure out what items to leave in the trust. This is very important, folks, because we are talking here about asset allocation. A trust is a legal entity. And if you're transferring asset to the to the trust, you are somehow allocating assets from one entity to the other. So, for instance, you are transferring, say, your brokerage account, your portfolio, the stocks and bonds that you own in your brokerage account into the trust. So you probably don't have to hold all your property in your living trust. You can just focus on the big ticket items, the significant property, the significant asset that you have. Because think about it, the bottom line here is that you want to avoid probate, right? That's the the main, that's the essential objective that most people pursue when they are creating a trust. You want to avoid probate, so you want to focus on those significant assets, the big ticket items. What property do you have to put in a living trust? You want to think about your most valuable property. And by most valuable, I'm talking about houses and other real estate and it doesn't matter even if they're mortgaged you can still transfer them into the property into the living trust why because as you are making mortgage payments every month the principal amount that you owe the bank the lender is going down so at some point that property will become yours that house that apartment will become yours you can also transfer into the living trust stock bond and other security account held by a brokerage so if you have if you are with a with a bank or a brokerage company you can transfer those securities into your living trust you can if you can also transfer small business interest for example if you own stock in a closely held corporation or you have partnership interest or LLC shares, LLC stands for limited liability company shares, you can transfer those, those assets into the living trust. Things like patents and copyrights also can be transferred into the living trust. Precious metals, we've seen a lot of uh, in the last few years with, uh, with inflationary concerns and with, with uh, big swings in the global economy, a lot of investors are now being are being very cautious about investing in the primary mar market in stocks and bonds. So they're transferring their asset into more alternative investments, such as precious, precious metals, gold, silver. So you can transfer those also into the trust. Other assets that you can transfer into the trust include 
valuable works of art, furniture or antiques. And if you have valuable collections of stamps, coins or other objects, those also can be transferred into the trust. So you want to figure out what items to leave in the trust. Now let's talk about the third step here. You need to decide who will inherit your trust by property. For most people, and certainly for you, you want to choose your family members, your friend or charities to inherit property. So you can choose your children, you can choose your next of kin, you can choose friends that play an important part of your life, or as 30% uh, of Americans do every year, you can transfer the, uh, the property, you can make a charity, the heir to your trust. So after you make your first choices, it's very important, it's very key here to choose alternate beneficiaries. Legal experts also call alternate beneficiaries contingent beneficiaries. Think of them as backup plans, backup beneficiaries. So if something, let's say you want to transfer property currently situated in the trust, you want to transfer that property to your son and something happens to your son, your son becomes incapacitated and the court decided he is not, I would say, legally capable of uh, receiving the trust, the trust property. You can have a contingent beneficiary. That could be a charity. That could be a your alma mater, your college or university to transfer the, the property to. Once you decide who will inherit your trust property, you need to make sure you choose someone to be your successor trustee. Why? Life happens, stuff happens, things happen. You, you could be gone tomorrow. You're here today, right? But <laughs> who knows? Tomorrow you could be gone. So the idea here is to cover your back. Cover your back legally, socially, physically, and financially. Because the whole, the gist of preparing a living trust is to avoid probate, but also cover yourself financially after you're gone. So you, you need to choose a backup trustee that will be your successor trustee so your trust must essentially name someone to serve as a successor, tr successor trustee to distribute trust property to the beneficiaries after you're gone a lot of folks choose a grown son or daughter it could be another relative it can be a next of kin or a close friend to serve as successor trustee now you can see that we're talking here about making a living trust and we're talking about a successor trustee so the word the word the root here the root word is trust so the person you need to choose to be your successor trustee has to be a trustworthy person a confidant someone you have total comp total trust in so if you are choosing a friend it doesn't matter whether you're choosing a relative or or a friend or or a colleague or the, the the pastor at your church or the the rabbi at your synagogue or the, the imam at your mosque doesn't really matter you want to trust that person you want to make sure the person you want to feel deep inside of you of yourself that after you're gone after you pass away this person will carry your instruction will carry out you will carry out your instructions to the they, they will be as uh, faithful as possible in carrying out your instructions. It is perfectly legal to name a trust beneficiary that is someone who will receive trust property after your death. It is very legal, it's common in all 50 states, even in Canada and Australia. So once you've made your choice, you wanna discuss it with the person you have in mind to make sure he or she is willing to take on that responsibility. Because the last thing you want is to surprise the person you know he or she wasn't expecting something like this and after after you, you pass away the they have to take care of that and uh, no you want to have a conversation with that person make sure that they're they're on board and if they're not you want to move on to somebody else i'll be right back right after this don't go anywhere Welcome back, folks, to another edition of Sweetie Kiwi. We are still talking today about 
making a living trust and I'm giving you the complete guide for rookies in simple language. If you love the clarity and quality of the, of the content so far, please consider subscribing to our channel and turn on the notification bell so we can send you data and send you more content every single day, rain or shine. Share this content, like and comment below. The next thing you want to do after choosing someone to be a successor trustee is to choose someone to manage property for youngsters. This is critical if you have young kids who are who you have minors you're, that you're still taking care of so that if something happens they have the proper the legal legal compass moral compass and social compass to move on in life so if children or young adults might inherit trust property you should choose an adult to manage whatever they inherit and here by property i mean everything not just physical property tangible property but also, but also intangible right by intangibles, I mean patents and copyrights. If you have electronic properties, I mean electronic assets, not really, not really electronic, I mean financial assets, such as stock, bonds, ETFs, electronically traded funds, gold, silver, you want to have someone to manage that for them, to make that kind of property for youngsters. To give that person authority over the child's property, you can make him or her a property guardian, a property custodian under a law called the Uniform Transfers to Minor Act or a trustee. So there is a law called the UTMA UTMA, the Uniform Transfers to Minors Act that regulates that oversees the transfers of property from um, trust creator, trust makers to beneficiaries, beneficiaries who are still minors. Once you have done all those things, you need to prepare the trust documents. So you can create, and there are several ways to do this. And I'm going to break it down for you. The three main ways you can do this are you can reach out to a lawyer. You can uh, find a template on the internet. Or you can use software. And those, soft, those programs are becoming sophisticated by the day. So you can find, I'm not going to name names here. We're not endorsing any particular software provider. But I can tell you that if you just Google or Bing the word trust document software or trust preparation software, you'll have gazillions of programs out there that fit the bill. And they're getting as sophisticated as they're getting more sophisticated every single day. So you can create a simple living trust document. And this is formally known as a declaration of trust or trust instrument yourself. If you have good information and help, right? So you can also, as I said, you can also use a template or you can go on the internet and get software. If you don't want to make your own trust, or if for some reason you need more than a simple probate avoidant trust, you can work with an attorney to draft a trust to meet your specific needs. And again, needless to say, this program is not about offering legal advice. We have gathered relevant information about the topic we're talking about today. And our goal is to share as much as much as possible with you. But if you need specific needs, if you have specific needs, if your situation is, I would say, a little complex or you just need expert guidance, please reach out to an attorney. Reach out to someone who understands the subtleties of a living trust. And how do you find the right lawyer who can help you make a living trust? Several ways. You can go through personal, your personal referrals. So ask people around you yourself if, you know, friends, family, members colleagues you can you can seek online there are online services by the way you have lawyer directory members you have yellow pages you have business referrals you have lawyer referral services so you have a whole catalog of services a whole catalog of options when it comes to finding the right lawyer who can help you make a living trust
So once you have prepared the trust documents, whether through a lawyer or a template or through software, you need to sign the document, the trust document, and get your signature notarized. Folks, this is salient. This phase, this stage is important. After making your trust document, you got to sign it and you have to sign it in front of a notary public. And if you have a shared trust, you need you and your spouse need to sign it in front of a notary public. Now, we're currently in the midst of a pandemic where people have not people don't want to meet face to face. There are a lot of ways. There are even ways to notarize documents nowadays on the Internet. We have uh, covered this topic in a different a different show. So you might want to double check that show. Next, you have to transfer the title of the property to yourself as a trustee. Remember, we, I was talking to you earlier about choosing yourself as the as a trustee and then having a backup trustee, right? A successor trustee. So once you transfer title of property to yourself as a trustee, you, you, you want to guarantee that the property is yours. The property is the trust's property, but ultimately yours. Unfortunately, some people never take this this step even though it is crucial to make your trust effective you must hold title to trust property in your name as trustee here for instance you can say if jane doe wants to hold real estate in her trust she must prepare and sign a new deed transferring the real estate to jane doe comma trustee of the jane doe revocable living trust dated august 31st 20 20 2021 so this is very formal and courts have been very adamant in the last few years at making sure that people are being formal people are following the rules in terms of naming living trust once you do this you want to store your trust document safely you don't need to file your trust document with the court or any government agency this is not a this is not a, an incorporation documents this is not an article of incorporation no you do your trust you notarize it and you store it away you just want to keep it in a safe place for example it can be at a post office at a, at a you know at a vault at a bank or a post office it can be a small fireproof home safe and make sure whatever you do that you need to tell your successor trustee where the trust document is and how to access it when the time comes because the last thing you want to do is the last the one thing you want to have is a trust document that is legally sound that has been well prepared and nobody can find it <laughs> right it's not what we want to go it's counterproductive so tell people what's going on in your life particularly when it comes to end of life arrangements such as making a living trust well making a living trust is not really an end of life arrangement it's more part of the whole estate planning process okay folks thank you so much for listening to today's conversation i want to quickly recap today's uh, today's talk making a living trust the complete guide for rookies there are nine steps that i have discussed with you decide what you need do you need a shared document a shared trust rather or an individual trust figure out what items to leave in the trust decide who will inherit your trust property choose someone to be your successor trustee choose someone to manage property for youngsters prepare the trust document sign the trust document and get your signature notarized transfer title of property to yourself as trustee store your trust document safely I will see you next time. I really appreciate your attention today. And until then, remember, stay marvelous.